In this panel, we're going to hear from two experts and two longtime allies, the American Association of Kidney Patients, on how patient consumer demand is driving innovation in kidney diseases. Our first speaker is a very good friend of ours, Foko Wyanger, who is an engineer and a principal scientist for IMEC in the Netherlands. He's also associated with the Dutch Kidney Foundation. And Foko's approach to engineering is all about human factors, what makes sense to the patient and why the patient has to be at the center of any new innovation that's occurring, especially in the area of artificial implantable organs or wearable organs. Foco has been a true champion of patients. He has a very broad view of how collaboration should work and is somebody that seeks to develop international partnerships in order to advance science and to speed innovations forward for patients. Foco, go right ahead. Hi, I'm Foco Wieringha from the Netherlands. And I'm very pleased that I can speak at the American Association of Kidney Patients Forum in 2022. So we're going to talk about back to the future. How might the life of kidney failure patients look like in 2030? Now, we also presented these slides during a meeting in the European Parliament uh, during the European Kidney Forum in June 15th. Before we start, there's, of course, also the conflict of interests. Well, there's also an interest in the conflict in Ukraine. I hope the Ukraine wins. For the rest, I'm 100% employed by IMEC. I am 5% of my time hired as a consultant by the Dutch Kidney Foundation. I am 5% of my time hired by the Neo Kidney um, Project, which is making a portable artificial kidney. 10% of my time, I'm working in the UMC Utrecht as an associate professor of medical technology. And I'm the chair of the Breakthrough Technology Workgroup of the European Kidney Health Alliance. Furthermore, I represent the Netherlands within the IEC and ISO working groups on the standardization of dialysis technology. In 1945, the world's first successful hemodialysis session was done by Dr. Kolf in the Netherlands, a very small country, and it was just after World War II. Dr. Kolf was so incredibly thankful to the liberators of the Netherlands that on his own cost, he sent four extra machines to London, to Poland, to Canada and the United States. And five years later, he and his family followed and emigrated to the US to become citizens of the US. And what happened there was a huge amount of innovation together with other doctors and technologists and by 1972, dialysis had grown so far that President Nixon signed a very well-intended law that would re regulate dialysis reimbursement for the citizens via CMS. And by that time, you have to see, and the back to the future comes from this moment, that 90% of the dialysis patients in the US 90% of the, of course, very few patients that were worldwide there, but 90% of those treated themselves at home. And the atmosphere was very optimistic. People really had the idea, the scientists, the patients, and also the firms, you know, that dialysis will be portable in 10 years. Unfortunately, that didn't happen. After 50 years of adding smartness into nearly everything, we see that this patient has not only lost his hair, but also his hope. He's still stuck to the wall, even though his vacuum cleaner has become a robot and his toilet is so smart that it can order the toilet paper if it's almost gone by a drone. So what can we do? So we made an infographic that says dialysis and even transplantation do not form a cure. They are a make-do treatment that is, of course, keeping patients alive, but not giving them the life that they'd really like to have. And we can do better. And we've been with this poster and we've taken this message to the European Parliament. The lady standing next to me here is Hilda Voutmans. She's the chair of the Members of European Parliament Group on Kidney Health, which is the European equivalent of your great U.S. Congressional Kidney Caucus. And we know that they also 
see a heavy interest in getting better treatments for the patients. So on both sides of the Atlantic, we see that the decade of the kidney is bringing minds to the same stage, which is great. She wants to help us to realize this roadmap to freedom from presently in stuck in a chair or bed towards in 2024, being able to travel with a suitcase kidney that even would go as hand luggage in the airplane. But we wanna go on. And 2030, a 24 seven functional implantable artificial kidney might be realized. And all these improvements, they will improve the quality of life, the eco-friendliness eco of the solution, and also being much more cost effective. It'll save a lot of electric energy. A normal hemodialysis session at this moment of four hours costs three to five kilowatt hours, whereas the whole human body, not just a kidney, only consumes 0.3 kilowatt hours in the same four hours. Then also the amount of plastic tubing made for dialysis only yearly is enough to go four times to the moon and back. Can you imagine if we would save all that plastic tubing by having an implantable artificial kidney? And then think about the global water shortage. Well, there's a lot of countries where there's water shortage and you can believe it or not, but this year the Netherlands even had an official drought. The Netherlands of all countries which always has to fight against the water, now has to hoard the water because we have too little of it. So you can imagine saving that kind of water would be great. And we can. Think about a traditional hemodialysis treatment at the moment. At the moment, only one third of the water is actually used for the treatment and then discarded after single use. Two thirds of the water is not even seeing the patient because it's discarded in the reverse osmosis treatment center before even getting to the patient. And this is only for one treatment. Can you imagine you need 156 pellets per patient per year with existing hemodialysis as it is now? Whereas we only drink a fraction of that water per day because, and this is the secret, our kidneys are super water purifiers. If you build the building blocks for an artificial implantable kidney, you also boost the technologies to do much more effective, much more compact and much more cheaper seawater desalination. Those two are heavily intertwined. Think about that, not only helping the people that are depending on dialysis, but helping the whole world population to get better drinking water which is very actual. And chip technology can be a key enabler to do so. We have written a European proposal for the European Research Council, which is called KidneyU, to work on these kinds of filter technologies. And by 2030, if we work together internationally with all the brilliant groups all over the world, and there's a lot of them in America as well, then an implantable artificial kidney surely would be doable. It could be controlled by tiny electronics that fit on your fingertip with complete a processor on board and uh, memory and wireless charging, everything on there. For instance, monitoring of medical parameters could be built into such an artificial kidney. It would have a companion device, a wearable device for periodic charging and communication so that telehealth is possible with this solution. And this is not science fiction. The, the pieces of the puzzle to make this are actually already existing worldwide. Still, it's a lot of engineering, but it's like a bit of a Kennedy moment when Kennedy said, it's our intention to put a man on the moon and safely return him before the end of this decade. That is the same spirit that the decade of the kidney of the AAKP holds and we are confident it can be done. If only, and then we go on to the next slide, we have to bundle the best brains to build better treatments. We have to work together with patients and doctors and nurses, policymakers and inventors and investors and engineers and entrepreneurs. They can all work together in the decade of the kidney, which is founded by AAKP, but also has been 
adopted by the European Kidney Patient Federation and by the European Kidney Health Alliance. And to do all this, we need a good and solid funding program that is really needed. And the decade of the kidney can be the bridge that would work between the US and the European Union and maybe a lot of other countries as well to, in, in the end, get into an implantable artificial kidney. And this small cartoon, of course, is with euros, but we know that it also will work with dollars or yens, no problem at all. So we need a solid funding program. And believe me or not, but getting an implantable artificial kidney would about cost the same amount of money that you would need to build a new four lane interstate highway of 200 kilometers long. I mean, it's a big project, of course, and it's a lot of money you would need. Everybody knows that. But we also know that every developed country in the world would be able to bring the money for such a program. And if we work together, it would be better. We simply need to bundle the best brains around the world. And with that, I say it's time to act and get our on our way back to the future. Thank you very much for this opportunity to speak here during the AAKP Global Summit. It is really an honor and a pleasure to be invited and talk about these things. Let's get to work. Thank you very much, Foco. We appreciate the partnership with the American Association of Kidney Patients and for your longstanding advocacy for patients globally.